there was a tremendous amount of research coming out about the health benefits of chocolate and it was loaded in antioxidants and it was a heart healthy saturated fat that actually lowered your cholesterol. And so all of a sudden the, 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 the snack that everybody felt they needed to hide in their desk drawer, if they even had two pounds to lose, was something that uh, people felt good about eating. Welcome to Sound Financial Bites, where we help you with bite-sized pieces of financial and life knowledge to help you design and build a good life. The knowledge that has been shared from stages at conferences, pages of national business magazines, and clients living across America, our host, Paul Adams, now brings directly to you. Hello and welcome to Sound Financial Bites. I'm Paul Adams, and I'm so happy to be your host. We have a sweet (laughs) guest today, and she is going to share with us some insights that she's had about building a company and more importantly, building an indulgent career. Now, for many of you listening to this, you may have heard some of our other podcasts. We have the ones that focus deep on financials like analytical, those that are financial philosophy. We have those like John Medina that was in the area of being able to take better care of your brain as you age, things that are good for a good life overall. Though today, we have more of that business and career philosophy. And Gene Thompson of Seattle Chocolates has chosen and been willing to join us in talking about what it's been like to build her company like many people do whether it's a career or a company, building it by default, that we get one opportunity in front of the next. And she's going to tell us her story of how she became owner of Seattle Chocolates and really what going through the life by default, one opportunity after the next has actually led her to being able to lead her company by design differently than perhaps the way she first got into it. So Jean, welcome to Sound Financial Bites. Thank you so much, yeah, Delighted to be here. Uh, and I am so excited to have you. And not only, you guys are going to want to stay here till the end because we actually have an amazing, amazing giveaway uh, today. Thanks to uh, Jean and her company. And this one's going to have to be like we only have one of them. So we got to kind of toss it up in the air and see who gets it. But stay until near the end. And then we're going to uh, find out how you can enter to win this great gift from Seattle Chocolate. So Jean... You started not in the chocolate business. Tell me about your early career. Uh, my early career was in high tech, um, like probably a lot of people here in Seattle. And actually, mine started in Connecticut. I was from the East Coast and then moved to Seattle in the late 80s to work at Microsoft at a really good time to work there. But I was in uh, I was in a non-technical role. I was in corporate communications. Loved it. Great time to be at Microsoft. There was so much responsibility that you had as someone in your 20s. And then I worked there for about four years and uh, retired temporarily to take care of two kids. Mm-hmm. So I spent nine years as an at-home mom. And then when my youngest went off to kindergarten, which was 15 years ago now, I wanted to do something. And uh, I was thinking teaching or finding some sort of creative outlet. Definitely not business. I was not interested in business. But we were investors early on in Seattle Chocolates uh, life. So Seattle Chocolates has been around since 92. It's 25 years old now. And um, uh, it was around four or five years old when we, my family, um, started investing. And we were maybe one of a dozen different investors in the company. And um, it kind of struggled. It struggled a lot for its first 10 years. And then I think it was year eight that uh, the Nisqually Quake leveled the building that it was in, um, in the Soto area. And it was red tagged. And the machines that were in there, um, you know, we had to go in with hard hats uh, under cloak of darkness and and rescue those machines. But somebody needed to step up and put a lot of money in to uh, retrofit a new building, to pay for the move, et cetera. Am I going to going no, into too much this detail? this is great. I just, yeah, uh, Jean and I are also on video right now chatting and she sees the look on my face like, oh, this is, you mean... It, the building's condemned yeah. by red tagged. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it nobody's allowed to go in. Right. But you and some other people went in literally with hard hats. After nobody's going to care that you're in there, hopefully, and actually extracted all the chocolateering machines. I don't know yeah, if I'm using the right thing. term. Well, so I do have to. Um, I didn't personally put on the hard hat. I wasn't even working at Seattle Chocolate at the time, right? I you just, were already acting like a CEO. You yeah, had boss and everyone other around. People. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know the the then CEO uh, basically did that, and you know to his great credit, and probably had a team of people helping him. But you know the machines are huge, so there's like 
drayage involved. This isn't just a, oh, let's pick up and throw it in the back of your pickup truck. There's, this is yeah. a massive undertaking to move machines, very expensive. And because I've done it since then when I got a bigger space and it's expensive just to move them. And um, then, of course, you had to find a building really quickly and get air conditioning and insulation and make sure it would be food grade. So there was just a lot of money that was involved, which Seattle Chocolate didn't have. So the Thompson family basically stepped up and said, we'll do it. We put the money in. So that, you know, one-two punch, that person doing the work and us putting in the money is what saved Seattle Chocolate back in, you know, 2001. Yeah. So, and, yeah. And that quake, literally you said condemned to basically two buildings and they were both Seattle Chocolates buildings. Yeah. So it was funny. Yeah. I don't know if this is a sign from above, but so the Seattle Chocolate building, which was, we didn't own, um, was right across the street from the Starbucks headquarters and Seattle Chocolate didn't have enough space for its inventory. So it rented some space um, in a corner of Starbucks building and that corner was also damaged, but only that corner, the rest of the building was fine. So apparently somebody was saying there needs to be a change at Seattle Chocolate or maybe it was time to throw in the towel, which was definitely something that we all considered. You know, this seems to be a sign from above. Maybe we should just say enough. And it, it's been 10 years and it's not successful. But we didn't do that. So happily. And um, moved it and started off. And the building was way too small that we found. And it, it introduced another layer of problems. And within five years, we had to find a bigger space and move again. But, you know, at this critical time, you had to do what you had to do to survive. So that was in 2001. And um, my daughter went off to kindergarten in 2002. So that's when I got involved thinking, oh, I'll just work part-time and won't collect a salary and I'll just help them with their marketing, which was my background. And um, within, and, it was probably, and it, yeah. And you didn't need a salary because you had already attained a certain level of financial success. Yeah. Um, as the um, DFI. Yeah. Um, we had achieved, thank you, Microsoft, the early days of Microsoft um, it was a lucrative time to be there, you know, better lucky than good. And um, so I didn't necessarily need to work. Uh, I did in terms of my intellectual, my yes. my happiness factor. I needed to do something, but I didn't have to do it for the financial. So I, I worked part-time and then my um, the guy who was the CEO quit. And that's kind of a story all of its own, definitely not podcast appropriate. And so he quit. And um, I was left sort of with another decision, another crossroads of do I let it you know, just do I hire somebody? We really didn't have the money for that. But, but then I had a little bit of a taste of, you know, this is really a cool product. And I really like this product. And it seems to me like um, the people You're in the- you got a taste of the chocolate business? I got a taste of the chocolate. <laughs> I'd been tasting it for a while, but I got a taste of the chocolate business. Yes. And also I felt like, wow, these people are not doing things the way that I think they should be doing things in the chocolate industry. It was very, you know, earth tones and brown, like as if people wouldn't know what it was if it wasn't the color brown. And mm. uh, the marketing- um, as I had a marketing background, I thought was very much, uh, it was just off base. They were you know, depicting women who are waiting at home in their sexy negligee for their husband to come and give them a box of chocolates. And I thought, yeah, no, that is not how I eat chocolate or buy chocolate, <laughs> nor any of my friends. So I think they're really missing the mark. So it seemed like there was a lot of opportunity. And at the same time, there was a tremendous amount of research coming out about the health benefits of chocolate. And it was loaded in antioxidants and it was a heart healthy saturated fat that actually lowered your your cholesterol. And so all of a sudden, the, 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 the snack that everybody felt they needed to hide in their desk drawer, if they even had two pounds to lose, was something that uh, people felt good about eating because it was actually good for you. So all this and, was sort of coming together. And each of those things that I think all of our listeners can relate to is that you had one opportunity, then another one came up or another challenge came up. And what you had to do was just choose at that crossroads, which is what happens to all of us as yeah. we're progressing in our career, that you're building something, you hope it's the right thing, you are taking it for the people that are listening that have like an executive type career, you're taking that next job opportunity. And sometimes those lead to great outcomes like, hey, I, you know, I have more autonomy and freedom than I ever hoped, or it leads down a path of, we get several years down the road and say, well, gosh, I'm traveling all the time and I don't have time for my family. Like people end up at those different spots. Yeah. And, but so you built that through from the time you took over till about 2012 and you said, I'm going to do something radically different. Share with us. Yeah. So um, that was sort of the tail end of the um, recession 
And everybody mm-hmm. was, you know, everything was starting to shrink. I mean, we were flat for three or four years in our sales, even though we thought we were doing everything right. And it was because our retailers weren't, you know, they were all hunkering down and playing it yes. safe, right? Yes. Which I'm actually seeing signs of this happening right now too, but for other reasons, I think. But uh, so we thought, well, what can we do to disrupt things and um, make a mark? And so we decided to come up with a even higher end, more premium brand called J. Coco which we released about five years ago, so around 2012. But we started thinking about it like in 2010 and doing the branding and the research and all of that. So it took a couple of years to um, bring it to market. And um, it basically all the learnings I had had to that point of what I wish was different. Like I wish... I kind of like a solid piece of chocolate rather than a truffle bar. I, you know, would, would love it if it wasn't a two and a half ounce bar, which is, you know, 450 calories. I'd rather it be a one ounce bar. But so we did three one ounce bars in our package so that you could eat one and save one for later. So this portion control notion. Or at and least then, I could eat the first one and I could think I won't eat the other one for two more hours. Exactly. No, seriously, you would be surprised when that bar is open and you feel like it's possibly going to be wasted and you shove it in your bag and it gets all, you know, kind of crummy and nasty and melts everywhere. That is a deterrent and we don't like to waste and plus it's good, right? So we want to keep eating it. So now you've overindulged. So the idea was, you know, one ounce of chocolate, you can eat with pretty much no guilt and you can share it. And the idea of breaking bread with uh, a friend, you know, something that you do with chocolate. So save it. We'd like to joke breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but you can also give it to a friend or save it for tomorrow. Now you're eating the right amount of chocolate, right? I love the breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah, like that's, it's, that's why it's in three yeah. pieces. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> exactly. Or if you um, have two friends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, And two for me, one for you. Yeah. So uh, the other thing that we did was this sort of built-in philanthropic um, we decided, you know, we need to do something uh, because chocolate is America's favorite flavor. People are eating chocolate and they love it. And you have this power as a chocolate company to make a difference just by virtue of the fact that you're working with a product that people love, right? Yes. So we thought about what would we do? We thought maybe, you know, dress for success or something for women, you know, to get women back in uh, the workforce since it's a woman-owned company. And then it came to us that really chocolate's a food. It's an indulgent food one that you don't have to eat, but you want to eat, right? So uh, what if we helped people who were unable to get food regularly? Because one out of every six American is food challenged. And it's horrible. I personally do not do well when I'm hungry. I get really irritable and you you don't want to be around me. I'm definitely a hangry person. So I thought, shoot, some people are forced to be that way all the time and go to school and not have enough food. And so what we do is we built in um, a giving mission where when you buy a J. Coco, we'll donate a serving of fresh food to a local food bank. Again, it was after the recession and everybody, you know, in chocolate's very focused on origin, which for sure is a needy place. But guess what? So is the U.S., right? The U.S. needs some assistance. There's kids in my own backyard of Bellevue that, you know, they can't go to school every day because they're sharing shoes with their brother, right? This this, yeah. this is real. And we have to give where uh, we live and help with our own community. So that's that became sort of a built-in. So Jake Coco encapsulated all of those things that we wanted to do. Gene, as soon as we get back from our break, I want to ask you a little bit about What's happened is you've grown the company both from an employee perspective and you've taken some other risks beyond rebuilding a whole other brand. On top of it, you're starting to do some unique things with the company, allow people to step into the brand. Yeah. I'm going to ask you about that as soon as we get back. Okay, awesome. Thanks. At Sound Financial Group, we are committed to continuing to bring you Sound Financial Bites. Hello, my name is Corey Shepard, president of Sound Financial Group. If you are finding value in these weekly podcasts and they are making a difference in the way you think about money, then think about what kind of a difference could be made if you engaged one of our advisors to help you look at your personal finances. So what would the next step be? Send an email to info at sfgwa.com with philosophy in the subject line, and we will coordinate with you to have a conversation with Paul myself, or one of our other advisors to share with you our philosophy of money. No one is going to close you on that call. No one is going to make you an offer to become a client. The only thing we allow our advisors to do in that call is teach. And the only thing we allow you to do is ask for an application. While we don't accept everyone who applies to work with us, we are committed that any Sound Financial Bites listener who wants to go deeper has the chance to expand their thinking and walk away with new education and resources around money. So even if we find out we aren't right to work together, our team will absolutely take care of you in that call and make sure that you have access to resources that might be of help to you. 
So Gene, we've now learned a, just how you developed this career. You built a career originally in technology and marketing. You managed by being able to save your pennies plus having some, what'd you say, it's better to be lucky than good yeah. at Microsoft. And, <laughs> mm-hmm. But you had reached definite financial independence, DFI, where you didn't need to be able to make money right away as you bought out the rest of the stock of Seattle Chocolates and began running it, much by accident. Uh, and then one accident after the next, you reached this stage where you went into design. We're going to design a fresh brand, a fresh way of looking at chocolate, a fresh way of portion control, which I think is very different. So many other chocolate makers make the bars bigger and exactly. bigger and bigger. Yeah. And you feel like more of a degenerate when you're done with it than when you started. <laughs> so I, I love that. But can you share with our audience what you've taken some new risks in the last few years, along with the J. Coco brand mm-hmm. and the philanthropic mission? Yeah. So we've been um, trying to figure out how to elevate the dialogue around chocolate. That's sort of how the whole thing started for me was, you know, what can we do to get ch- people to think about chocolate as not a indulgent sugary treat or dessert, but rather something that is good for you, right? So um, people feel permission to eat it, but they still feel a little guilty and um, mm-hmm. it is fattening, right? So what we, uh, I, I've been traveling to Nicaragua or Ecuador, or other origin countries to really understand cacao, which is the name of the tree that it comes mm-hmm. from. And, you know, it's very much, uh, there's a lot of parallels to wine. Now, when you go to somebody's house, you always bring a bottle of wine, at least in the Northwest, right? And, and sometimes mm-hmm. it's, you know, $50, $80 for a nice bottle of wine, and nobody you really know, thinks twice about that. But chocolate, there's the ceiling on how much people are willing to spend. And yet, the process for developing chocolate from the cacao bean to a chocolate bar is so much more complicated and so much more labor intensive. And um, cacao or you know cocoa on um, the commodities market is super expensive and fluctuating. The packaging is super expensive. The transportation, because it melts, is super expensive. And yet, it's very dumbed down. And so I think that there needs to be some sort of a transformation of the whole entire category from the sugary indulgent snack to something that is discussion worthy. It's a food. It's a foodie food. I mean, there's so much complexity to the flavor profile. There's so much complexity to how it's grown and fermented and dried and how that translates to a particular flavor profile. And people don't know anything about it. So I decided, okay, how would, how would I tell them? I mean, how do you explain this? And what we decided to do was open the doors to our factory um, so that we could invite our customers in and we could start developing a dialogue with them. We can teach them stuff. We can um, explain. I mean, we right now we have, we opened our tours in February of this year. Um, for the first time in the 25-year history of Seattle Chocolates, it's open. And um, people come in and we show them what a cacao tree looks like and where it's grown. And we talk about the history and the rich history of chocolate. And, um, and most people have never heard any of that. So we're starting at the beginning, right? Sort of Chocolate 101. Where the next thing will be to talk about like percent cacao and what difference that makes in the flavor profile and origin and what difference that makes and um, how by changing this uh, parameter it will change this flavor profile because it's super interesting. And given that we are Seattle chocolate and Seattle is the foodie, I mean, the West Coast mm-hmm. is all pretty foodie, but Seattle is an amazing place and people who, uh, for food and people love it and they want to talk about it and they want to, you know, in, in, indulge themselves in it and share it with each other. And so I want to um, have chocolate play in that arena. So that mm-hmm. opening, so basically a uh, long-winded way of answering that I had to invest a significant amount of money into uh, retrofitting the um, warehouse to put this nine-foot elevated mezzanine and a glass wall to keep it safe and all of that, the food safe, and then put together a curriculum and videos. And so we invested pretty heavily in um, making that happen because I believe that that's the next great thing for chocolate. Well, and it's almost like, uh, you know, as I, as I listen to you, I think about there is a movement. I don't want to say a movement, like it's the current, it's the way the world thinks about chocolate is that it is junk food. Yep. It is cheap and it really is. And the bigger you buy it, the better off you are. Meaning like people go out and spend a bunch of money uh, trying to buy the biggest bag of M&Ms they can. <laughs> yeah. Or they are spending a bunch of money buying, you know, the bags of Reese's peanut butter cups, something I was raised on, which is awesome. Incidentally, if you like peanut butter and chocolate, Seattle Chocolates and Jay Coco have some amazing 
I don't know, is fla- I don't know if flavor is the right term, Jean. I'm like all nervous now that we're talking about it as a food and not just a junk food. <laughs> Sorry. So, no, yeah. it's, the perfect so, peanut butter bar from Seattle Chocolate is a white chocolate center. So instead of having whatever sugary, fatty base thing, it's actually based in white chocolate and then has peanut butter in it. And then it's covered with dark chocolate and it's kind of a grown up it Reese's was so cup. good. Yeah. yeah, it was I like so Gene gave me a taste of some of the stuff oh, that yeah. <laughs> d- that is not high quality enough to make it in customer packaging that she just threw in a bag and took with her where we were together at a conference and she gave me a taste and I didn't give the bag back. I just kept <laughs> it. So so when we look at that, it's like the this idea of being able to show up. Like I by the way, I'm seeing this now, and this is probably a good time to let our giveaway out of the bag, if you will. <laughs> is that uh, Gene's been very generous in sharing with our audience uh, a tasting of the J. Coco line, where you'll have several different flavors. Are they little one-ounce bars? Yes. If yes. I saw the box right. And these one-ounce bars would be the kind of thing you could bring to a party instead of bringing wine, which I love that because everybody has such differing tastes in wine. Some people like white, some people like red, some people are sensitive to it. I have never found somebody who's like, you know what? I just really don't do any chocolate. Yeah, Period. right. <laughs> and even people who are watching their weight, there's some biohacking things that I've done where the dark chocolate is actually perfectly fine. So I could yeah. see for myself totally uh, piggybacking on what you're saying. And my wife and I no longer bring wine anywhere. So anybody inviting us to dinner, just know we're not bringing wine now. We're bringing chocolate, and it's going to be the best possible kind. So, <laughs> that- and if you tell them that you're bringing it, um, you're ending up bringing their dessert for them. And mm. It's one less thing they have to prepare, and nobody really wants to have a 800 calorie slice of cheesecake. What they want is a little something sweet to finish the meal, and chocolate yes. is, you know, just the answer for that. And you know, 150 calories if you ate the whole one ounce bar. And quite frankly, 150 calories of chocolate is super satisfying. You don't need to eat the whole thing. You can split it with your spouse and then you, you've you hardly eaten anything. When, and with some of the biohacking things I've done, the, like the 85% or higher, uh, I'm going to say it wrong. I call it cocoa, but I'm probably supposed to say cacao now. Uh, <laughs> though when I get 85% or higher, the sugar content is low enough that I don't get the same insulin spiking I would and therefore my body not going down that cascade. So it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. And you don't have to even get 85 for that. Uh, the dark chocolates don't have sugar as their first ingredient. The milk mm. chocolates and the white chocolates tend to. I, I've never seen one that doesn't. Um, and so the dark doesn't have as much sugar in it. Right? It has more of that. And cacao, cocoa is fine. Um, well, cocoa is a specific. It's like the powder form. That's why we mm. say cacao. But just, just either side. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, they, uh, they have protein. They have like this great fat in them. So it really does stabilize your um, sort of nutritional intake. For me, I never get a sugar spike from dark chocolate. I love that. And the reason why Gene and I are now connected by video remotely is I actually happen to be down in the Orange County area, Newport Beach today. Uh, we're down here about three weeks with my family. I'm working a few days a week desk surfing at a <laughs> uh, friend's firm down here. I'm going to try to find some Seattle chocolates here in Newport Beach before the day's out. You are making me so hungry. Could I <laughs> ask though... For, to step a little bit away from the business. So you've built this indulgent career where you're really getting to focus on what you love in your career. And would you take just a couple of moments before, because I actually want to ask you just some general chocolate questions yeah. for people when they're looking out in the market, what they should watch for, et cetera. But tell me just how much you've enjoyed your career now and what you really love about your career and the business that you're building. And what I'm hoping for all of you listening is that you're going to get to hear something in what Gene says that you could apply to what you love in your current career or in your business and what it means to slough off some of the things yeah, or have somebody else do the things that you're not good at that they might love. Yeah. Yeah. So I never, um, as I said, I didn't think I'd had any interest in going into business because to me, business was, you know, spreadsheets and financials and, the stuff that I really didn't enjoy and, and really don't have an aptitude for. But what I found is when it's my own business and I didn't have anybody to answer to, I could pursue the things that I did enjoy, you know, staying in my genius zone, which for me is very much in the right um, part of my brain. I'm not, you know, overly in, in the financial end. I, I want to spend how time you, with the creative. For our audience, how do you define genius zone? 
So to me, the genius zone is staying where the thing that you uh, always find time to do, the thing that you'll uh, quickly answer that email or quickly uh, deal with that task is the stuff that you enjoy the most tends to be the stuff that you're the best at. And then, you know, when you see that, you know, P&L come through, you're like, I'll just look at that later, right? It, that's tends to be not your area of interest and therefore not your strength. And uh, what I found, it took me years to figure this out, was that I should surround myself with people who are really good at that stuff and who are good at communicating it to me and um, give the smarter people the job that they're the best at, right? Yes. Um, and I would never be able to put my financial person in the marketing department because that wouldn't be her thing, right? But for me, <laughs> um, as the, the head of my company, um, it, was a, it was really a great discovery to learn that I – could be a good leader and I could take my company, which was not profitable, and turn a profit by doing what I'm the best at, and that is the product development and the design and the flavor development and the creative stuff and, and doing uh, – we have a ha- – we will have by the time this podcast gets um, – broadcast, we will have just finished our very first haunted factory tour where we're opening our, our factory to the public and completely decorating it and turning our warehouse lights off and scaring um, children <laughs> and adults alike. <laughs> um, but because it's fun, right? I mean, this is what keeps everybody at the company super energized and where there's laughter in the halls and where I come to work on Monday and I sit in traffic and I never complain about the traffic because it was fun. I like coming here. But if I spent all day long crunching numbers and looking at reports and stuff, I probably would have only stayed at the company for five years. And then I would yes. have found somebody to do a better job at that stuff. Well, and uh, and I think, you know, for those of you that like this idea of genius zone, uh, don't hesitate to look up a guy by the name of Lex Sisney. We can throw him inside the show notes. Uh, Gene and I have some mutual friends who have used him as a coach. I have. He wrote a, uh, you've used him, yeah. yeah. So called Organizational Physics is uh, the name of his book and brilliant guy. And I love the idea. There's people that have different takes on it, but the idea of what is your genius zone. And for those of you hearing this and you're thinking, oh, this might apply to my business, I will share with you something I went through. And I don't know if you did either, Gene. Like, it's pretty hard if you're not a numbers person like Gene, right brain, marketing, et cetera, to conceive of the fact that somebody else not only is great at that, but they actually love that. Yeah. And I know things that are not in my genius zone. I don't get that people like it, but we will think I have to do it and almost like victimize ourselves thinking we must do these things. When in fact, not only is somebody else probably better at, but they actually like it. Yeah. And they're definitely better at it. their genius zone. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk just a little bit as we wrap on the idea of chocolates. Now, this is also where I want to let the cat out of the bag about the uh, this incredible gift that you're giving our audience, or at least somebody in our audience. And you can enter in the drawing at chocolates.sfgwa.com, chocolates.sfgwa.com. Hit that, put in your email address, your contact info, and we will let you know if you are the winner of that package and we'll get it out to you, refrigerated package, all that good stuff. And you're going to get a chance to show up with that instead of wine for the next dinner party. So when it comes to chocolate, if people don't have your product nearby or at a place that they can find it, I would suggest the first thing people should do is only have Seattle chocolates, if at all possible, <laughs> uh, or J. Coco. But if they don't have that brand, what should people watch for in terms of buying higher end chocolates? Because now that because of getting to know you, I've actually gone to stores and tried to look and it's like, this one says organic this and this one's this much dark chocolate. And I, yeah. it's like, I don't know what it is. I hope I like this one and I buy a bar and take it home. And sometimes you like it and sometimes you don't. And I don't. Th- the thing that's tricky about chocolate is that I don't think there is... Um, if you always buy a 72% dark, you will always like it because each and every person that manufactures the chocolate does it differently and Mm. to their taste, right? And I think taste is pretty subjective. So I think you just do have to do the trial and error. I think um, knowing uh, there's some part of it that I think a good consumer, especially someone from the Northwest who really likes to understand the people behind the brand and what they believe in, um, I think you can look for things like... um, Organic or Rainforest Alliance certified is what we use, um, which shows that you're buying it from a a source that pays their people fairly and that makes sure that the best farming practices are being adhered to and that, you know, no chemicals are being used and that kind of thing. That's important. They're not just plowing a chunk of rainforest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then if you don't want sugar, then of course go for the dark chocolate and um, it has some sugar in it and actually a a fair amount of sugar in it too. But um, then it really just comes down to the flavor profile that you like. 
and f- what they've put it with. So we always tend to do really fun combinations with Seattle chocolate of like toffee or espresso or mint. And then for J. Coco, we're more like a fig and a pistachio or a puffed quinoa, right? So it just really depends on your taste and when you're eating it and what you are looking for, what you're pairing it with. I mean, that's what's so interesting about it is there isn't like one best chocolate out there. Like this is the only chocolate to eat. There's no, you know, Rothschild sort of wine that is the gold standard that everybody wishes they could do, you know, blah, blah. Like there isn't wine. There isn't. There, and there's no wine spectator that says 92 yeah. or whatever. I mean, it has to be an individual trial and error, which, I mean, I can think of worse things than trying lots of different chocolates. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's very much like, you know, uh, your preference that you'll have. Some people like a cherry note in their chocolate. Some people like it to be a little bit more, you know, base and a little more stringent. It's kind of just like wine in that way. Like your red favorite is probably not my red favorite. Yes, yes. Well, and I, I think it almost goes back to the idea of wine, wine tasting. I had a chance to, um, well, actually, you were there too. The Ken Wright of yeah. uh, Ken Wright Cellars was talking, and he went through all these different things about how to think about wine. And what it came down to is, you should drink what you love the taste of. Exactly. It doesn't matter if it's a twenty dollar bottle of wine and you love it, drink that. Yeah. If it's a hundred dollar bottle of wine and that's the only thing you like, then drink that and don't worry about all the other stuff that goes into it. It sounds like you're saying very much the same thing. Yeah, and in fact I get a lot of there's some funny thing about I think because the dark chocolate is a little healthier in that it has less sugar, uh, people really want to like it better. And some people don't like it better. They really prefer yeah. milk chocolate. And guess what? There's still lots of antioxidants in the milk chocolate. Um, so if that's what you prefer, and let's face it, at the end of the day, it is, you're not eating your health food. You're eating something you really enjoy that's an indulgence for you. You should eat what you like. Right on. Yeah. Right on. Well, Jean, thank you so much for being here today. My Spending pleasure. Spending the time with us, sharing with our audience a little bit about your journey, which I think is not, uh, it's different, of course, but not dissimilar from what most people go through in that they graduate from one stage of their career to the next. And then at some point they have enough autonomy, freedom, and knowledge to pause and say, I'm going to build it my way like you did in launching the J. Coco brand, much against what would be tradition inside the industry. You would piggyback on your main brand only rather than building the brand that you want. And I would encourage all of you to pause maybe over the weekend after listening to this podcast, think it through, sit down with a journal and write down what you would change about your business or career if you could. And it's you'll be amazed what can come out of that. I also want to remind everybody, don't forget to enter to win this tasting sampler of Jean's $60 retail value that she's giving to our audience, chocolates.sfgwa.com, chocolates.sfgwa.com. Jean, again, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. And we hope that this has been a contribution to all of you to help you design and build a good life. I want to acknowledge you for taking the time to tune in to Sound Financial Bites. You stopped long enough in your busy day to reflect on your finances and your future to help you design and build a good life. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. If you have a topic you would like to hear us discuss, please send us a note on Facebook, LinkedIn, soundfinancialbites.com, or email us at info at sfgwa.com. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to any resources that were covered in each episode. For our full disclosure, please check the description of this episode, the description of this podcast series, or you can visit our website. Make it a great day.